Uh, our speaker this morning is Graham Hines. Graham is a good friend of mine. He's on staff with Power to Change at uh, McGill University. Graham's been on staff with Power to Change for five years now, working for four years at McGill University. Graham is someone that I have come to appreciate a lot. Um, he has a great relationship with my kids. He teases them a lot and they have a lot of fun together. Uh, he's also someone that, uh, that we've had the privilege of walking beside in some different ways as he has grown in his role at McGill and as he has um, as he's gone through some different things in his life that he's going to talk about today. And, and in particular, it's been, it's been a blessing for our family to walk with Graham just through some of the ways that, uh, that he's had a hard path in this past year and for our kids to wrestle with the goodness of God in the face of suffering. And that's what Graham's going to be talking with us about today. So I'll invite Graham to come up and, uh, and would you talk to me and just pray for Graham as he brings the word. Father, thanks for Graham. Thank you for the work of grace that you've done in his life. Thank you that, um, Lord, that you intervened in a, in a life that was going away from you, that was walking in rebellion, and you brought him under the lordship of Jesus, that you brought him to a relationship with Jesus, and that you have transformed him. Thank you for the man that he's becoming, and, and Father, thank you for all the ways that uh, you've been uh, using him to help students to discover Jesus in their life. Father, as you bring us the word, I pray that you'd give him clarity of thought, would you give him focus. I pray, Father, that uh, you would speak powerfully to us through your spirit. And Lord, as we pray for Graham, we pray for ourselves. And we ask, would you open our hearts to hear your word? And we confess that as a people, we come full of distractions and things that keep us from hearing you. Worries about jobs and about family and about all kinds of different things. And we pray, help us to put them aside so that we would hear your voice as Graham speaks. We pray this in Jesus' name. <coughs> Good morning, Bethel. Um, and thank you very much, Andy. I, um, I, I don't know a great deal about your church yet at this point, uh, just from what I've heard from Andy, but I do know that no one objected to me bringing my coffee to the pulpit this morning, which I'm very grateful of because I work with university students, and so this still feels pretty early for me. <laughs> they work on different schedules from the rest of us. Uh, it's been a real privilege to work with Andy for the past four years in Montreal. Uh, one of the things I appreciate about him is that he involves his family in his ministry. And he's been a blessing to me, and I, I, I trust and I know that he's been a blessing to your church family as well. Well, as Andy alluded, uh, some big things happened to me this past year. Uh, in fact, I would say 2015 was one of the... Um, yeah, a couple of life-altering events have happened with me. Two, two that I would bring up this morning. Um, the first is very exciting and very joyful. I got married just over four months ago to my beautiful wife, Erica. And it's been, um, it's been wonderful, and it's also been challenging to enter this, uh, this new phase of life with my best friend. And one of the other um, life-altering events that I experienced this past year is that uh, I suffered some pretty significant vision loss. And so, as I've been journeying through that, Andy invited me to come and share a little bit about how my life experiences have intersected with my faith in that area. And so just before we look at the scripture, I, I thought I would take a moment to share a bit about my, uh, my personal background and my experience with vision loss. So I was born legally blind. Um, and that's kind of a funny phrase, you know, what does it mean, did my family fill up the paperwork when I was born? But uh, there's actually two categories of people who are legally blind. So the first has to deal with having a limited uh, field of view. So if someone has tunnel vision that is uh, close to a certain point, they might be considered legally blind. Or if someone uh, has lost their central vision, and so they can only see from the periphery of their vision, they might be considered legally blind. That's the first camp of people. However, I fell into the second camp, which is someone with a full range of view, um, but low visual acuity. You need to be beneath 20 over 200 to be considered legally blind. And so in layman's terms, what that means is um, if, if I was at a restaurant with one of my friends, and we were looking at a TV across the room, and let's say my friend has perfect 20-20 vision, and I'm me, so 20-200, um, so I'm wearing the best glasses available, I have the best contact lenses. If I want to be able to see the TV as well as he sees it, I need to be 10 times closer. Um, so if we're 30 feet from the TV, if I want to see it as well as he does at 30 feet, I would need to be 3 feet from the TV. 
So I, I, I suppose another way of, of describing legal blindness is extremely nearsighted. And that's how I was born, and that's how I experienced life growing up. Um, and for me, I, I kind of feel like I just lived a normal, uh, normal life of a child. Um, maybe there were a couple differences. I had big Coke bottle glasses from the time I was a toddler. Um, in fact, they, I mean, you know, the church, toddlers are always rolling around doing somersaults. So my glasses wrapped around my ears to make sure they didn't fall off, which made it look like I was wearing earrings all the time, which was apparently very cute. Um, at school, I had large print books that the CNIV would send to me. Um, I had to sit at the front of the classroom, and when the teacher wrote on the board, I would have to go and stand next to the teacher while they were writing to be able to read uh, what they had written. And so in, in some cases, there were some differences about me, um, but I kind of just felt like a normal kid. And that's how I lived my life up until I turned eight. Um, when I was eight, I suffered a retinal detachment in my right eye. Um, I was very fortunate, uh, very blessed to have an excellent doctor at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, and uh, he was able to repair the, uh, the detached retina and save my vision. However, two years later when I was 10, I suffered three more retinal detachments in the same eye, and it seemed that it just wasn't going to stay up. And after the, uh, the final procedure, uh, there's so much scar tissue had developed in my eye that it was deemed inoperable, and I lost my vision in my right eye. And so now I was left with one eye that was legally blind, and one eye that was completely blind. Um, and I basically carried on that way. To be honest, I had already adjusted to the fact that I had low vision, and so losing one eye didn't seem to change too many things for me. Except at the dinner table, when people passed things to me, uh, they would always have to tell me that something was coming if it was on my right side. Um, I got involved in sports that didn't require hand-eye coordination, so I learned to adapt. I did swimming instead of playing baseball or tennis. Um, which seemed to be the better choice for me. And I just kind of carried on up until this past year. Uh, so that would be um, 16 years after the original retinal surgery. And then I had a retinal detachment in my left eye. And this was the eye that only, uh, my only eye with remaining vision. And that was a really scary moment for me. Because from my own experience and from my family's experience, a retinal detachment means you're going to lose your vision. Um, that was the case in my right eye, it was in the case of the left eye for my dad, and it was a case in one of the eyes for both of my grandfathers. And so from my perspective, uh, retinal detachment meant your vision was going to go. And that was scary, because I didn't have a backup anymore. Well, thanks be to God, I had, again, an excellent doctor at Toronto Western Hospital this time. I'm too big for sick kids now. And, uh, and I do still have vision. Uh, after two retinal surgeries, uh, no, three retinal surgeries, two retinal detachments. Uh, here I stand today, I still have some vision in my left eye, however it is diminished from where it used to be, rather significantly. So I've lost the center of my vision. Um, perhaps some of you have macular degeneration, and it's, it's rather similar to that. Um, and so I've had to make some adjustments this year in, in how I live my life. Um, I use the white cane to navigate Montreal. Um, I've been relearning how to use the computer and the phone. Um, been learning some braille and using audiobooks. Um, so there's been a number of big changes. And when Andy invited me to come to church this morning and share a bit about my perspective on suffering and how my faith intersects with that area of my life, I didn't know what to say, to be honest. I think perhaps I'm the kind of person who just was rolling with the punches and saying, well, I guess this is my new reality. And I didn't necessarily give my situation much introspection. And so I was struggling with what to say. And I was praying through which passages of the Bible should we look at together, which passages speak to me, which passages might speak to you. And as I was praying and wrestling, one passage kept coming up over and over and over. And so I decided, I guess that's the Holy Spirit telling me that there's something to share in this passage that speaks to me and hopefully to you as well. So I'd like to invite Andy to come back to the front again uh, he's here a lot this morning, and uh, uh, to read for us um, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. So 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. To keep me from becoming conceited, and because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, 
a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. When I read that passage, um, there's three points that jump out to me and that speak to me and I hope that they speak to you this morning as well. So if you're uh, the type of person that takes notes during church, these would be my three points to write down. The first is that God's power is made perfect in the thorn. The second is that the presence of a thorn does not indicate the, abs the absence of God's love. And thirdly, God will take every thorn away, but he does it at the cost of taking thorns onto himself. So God's power is made perfect in the thorn. The presence of a thorn does not indicate the absence of God's love. And God will take my thorns away and your thorns away, but he does it by taking them upon himself. <clears throat> God's power is made perfect in the thorn. I think the reason that this section of scripture resonates so much with me is because the one real struggle I have with my thorn of vision loss is that it makes me feel weak. There's a number of times in my life that kind of stick out and give examples of this. Um, when I was 16 years old, at high school, I remember when a bunch of my friends were getting their driver's licenses, and all of a sudden they were driving themselves to school, driving themselves out to the movies, uh, driving themselves to pick up girls to go on dates. These guys were becoming independent, and they were becoming men. And for me, I was still dependent on my parents for a ride, and I felt like a boy. I felt weak. I remember turning 18, and uh, I applied for a summer job with the ceremonial guard on Parliament Hill. Um, if you visited Ottawa, you might have seen them before. It's the, um, the group of musicians that do the changing of the guard ceremony with the big bearskin hats and red tunics. I played the bagpipes, so I thought it'd be a fun summer job. And I was actually hired uh, to do the job, and I started planning my summer to be in Ottawa. But after I did my physical screening with the military, they changed their mind, and I lost the position. And I felt rejected, and I felt weak. And even last year in Montreal, I remember I was walking to work, and uh, there was a group of construction workers who had just paved a new section of sidewalk, and I, I didn't see that they were working on it, and there, there weren't any, uh, as is common in Montreal, there was no warning <laughs> construction was ahead. And I stepped into the cement and fell face first into it. And the guys had to pull me out and hose me off, and I had to go home. And I felt humiliated, and I felt weak. And maybe some of you in this room, you have a thorn that makes you feel weak. And maybe this passage speaks to you as well. When we look at the context of Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he's actually um, addressing a problem that was going on in the church in Corinth. Paul had established a church there, um, but he was absent. And during his absence, um, some things were going on that weren't so great in Corinth. There was a group of uh, false apostles who had come to the church and were attempting to establish themselves as leaders in the Corinthian church. And they were introducing doctrine that was foreign to Christian teaching. They were introducing a gospel that was based on works and not on God's grace. And these super apostles were misleading people in Corinth, because they came with a long list of credentials as to why they had the right to be leaders in the church. And so, in your Bible, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 11 and 12, Paul responds by giving his own credentials for why he should be a leader of the church. And it's very interesting, because unlike the false apostles, Paul boasts not in his strengths, but in his weaknesses. He boasts in the times that he's been beaten for his faith. He boasts in the times that he was hiding in the wilderness, afraid. And he culminates his point by boasting in the fact that he has a physical disability. We don't know what the disability is, which I think is a good thing. Um, it, could be, it could have to do with vision. It could be epilepsy. I've heard a number of explanations. But Paul's final point is to boast in his physical weakness. 
And I think what he's addressing here is um, a cultural phenomenon that existed back then and still exists today. And it's our culture's propensity to be attracted to strength. The, uh, the false teachers were bringing strong credentials as to why they were the best leaders. And today, I think that our culture has that same propensity. I think about, uh, we have a multi-billion dollar industry designed to make us look young for as long as possible. Because we're afraid of growing old and the consequences that come with being old. Weakness. I think about the fact that we live in a celebrity culture in North America, where we idolize young, famous people because they are popular. And somehow their voices become more powerful than the voices of other people. And for those of us who aren't popular, it makes us feel weak. I think about our culture's obsession with uh, prosperity and being financially independent and the power that comes with money. And for those of us that don't have a lot of money, it can make us feel weak. And it's interesting because I don't think the church is exempt from this uh, propensity to idolize strength. Sometimes in the church we think, well, if we could just get a celebrity to pray to receive Christ publicly, cool, that would have an impact on our culture. Or if we just had a little bit of a louder voice in our culture, that would bring God's kingdom. If we just had a bit more strength as the church. And it's interesting because in this passage, Paul is saying that our culture's way is not God's way when it comes to strength. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Elsewhere, Paul says, uh, God uses the foolish things in the world to shame the wise. He uses the weak things to shame the strong. And your Bible is full of examples of this. I think about the story of Moses, a man with a speech impediment, who God takes before the throne of Pharaoh Pharaoh, a man so powerful in Egypt, he was actually considered to be a god. And God uses Moses, a man with a speech impediment, and leads the people of Israel to freedom. I think about David, the youngest son in a shepherd family, too young to even go to war against the Philistines. And what does God do? He uses this little shepherd boy to defeat the strongest champion of the Philistine army, Goliath. I think about the disciples, a group of young men, probably in their late teens, who were uneducated, and who, when they were brought before the councils of the scribes and Pharisees, they confounded and shamed the wisdom of the scribes and Pharisees. Or I think about Paul, who penned most of our New Testament, despite having a physical disability. God uses the weak to shame the strong, and God's power is made perfect in the thorn. Secondly, the presence of a thorn does not indicate the absence of God's love. I think that this is a very important point for us in the church today, because there's some teaching that's been creeping into Christian faith that I've heard on campus amongst my students. And it's the idea that God desires his followers to be happy, to be healthy, and to be prosperous. And it, maybe if you're like me, and you don't feel like you fit that criteria, it can be a crushing weight to have on your shoulders. Because we can wonder, what am I doing wrong? Uh, do I not have enough faith? Why, why is God doing this to me? But it's interesting, because when I look at the Bible and I read John 3.16, it doesn't say, for God so loved the world, he ensures perfect comfort for all of his followers. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God shows his love not necessarily in our comfort, but in the giving of his son. And when Paul um, prays three times that the Lord would take this thorn from him, God does not take it. Does God love Paul? Absolutely he loves Paul. I've had people pray for me that my thorn would be taken away, and God has not done so. Does God love me? Absolutely. And it's interesting because God re responds to Paul after Paul's third prayer. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. At that moment, I wonder, this is just speculation, I wonder if Paul was starting to feel that God didn't care for him or that he was abandoned. And God has to lift Paul's eyes above the waves that were surrounding his life to see the grace that God had given him. 
He has to lift his eyes above the waves of life. As I was preparing for this message today, I was talking with one of my coworkers on staff with Power to Change. And he mentioned to me and said, Graham, I don't mean to minimize the disability that you have, because I do understand it's a challenge. But there's a far greater disability. Imagine if God had not healed your soul. You know, imagine if perhaps God healed you physically, but didn't heal your soul. That is a far worse fate to live with. And he was right. But I think perhaps the challenge for us is that this issue isn't an intellectual one. I think um, many of us in the church, we know that, uh, that God's love is present for us despite our circumstances. We might know that intellectually, but it can be hard to feel it in our hearts when we're going through a trial or when we have a thorn. In fact, I think for each and every person in this room, there will come a time when, despite believing in your mind that God still loves you, you won't feel it anymore. And perhaps there's some people in this room who are experiencing and feeling that way right now. And to be honest, I don't think anything I can say can help with that. Uh, because I think I'm speaking at an intellectual level. We're dealing with some ideas and our minds, and what needs to be touched is your heart. So I'm just going to pause for a moment and actually pray for those people who I'm sure are in this room and are struggling to believe that God still loves them because their thorn is so, so great. So let me just pause and pray for those. Uh, Father, we just come before you and we, uh, we wish to empathize with our brothers and sisters who might have uh, a thorn in their flesh, who might have um, a suffering or a trial that they're going through, and, and they believe that you love them, but they don't feel it. And Father, that is such a hard place, and it's a place some of us have been in the past, and I think it's a place all of us will be at some point. Lord, we pray for those brothers and sisters, because um, I don't think there's anything we can say to heal the hurt that they experience, but it has to be a divine work of your Holy Spirit and a miracle. So Lord, would you come to them, would you comfort them, and would you help them to feel your love, and to feel it at their heart level, so that what they know in their mind could become true. I pray that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Lastly, the third point. There will be a day when God takes away every thorn, and that day was purchased by him taking the thorns upon himself. There will be a day. Revelations 21.4 looks forward to the new heaven and the new earth. And they talk about a day when God will wipe away every tear. When there will be no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain, no more death. There will be a day when every blind eye is opened. When every deaf ear is unstopped. When every person who is lame will be able to run and leap with joy. When every emotional thorn will be taken away when every injustice will be made right, when everything that is sad in this world will become untrue, there will be a day. And for those of us in this room who have a thorn that we're living with, you have a unique opportunity to reflect more deeply on that day and look forward to it. It's a good reminder that we were not made for this world. We were made for the new heaven and the new earth. And as we look forward to that day, I would encourage you to look beyond the fact that one day you will be healed from your thorn. Look beyond that fact to the one who made a thorn-free future possible for you. Because Jesus made that future possible for us by wearing a crown of thorns, by taking nails into his hands and into his feet, and by taking a spear into his side. Because without that action, we would have no hope of a future free of thorns. All have sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Um, but God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it was God's will that he would be crushed for our iniquities, and that he would be pierced for our transgressions. And upon him was the iniquity of us all laid upon him. And so as, as we, I would encourage you, because I think sometimes when we're struggling with a trial, it's important to remember that there is a future waiting for you, when you will not have that thorn anymore. But even more important than that, we need to look forward to seeing face to face the one who took away our thorns by wearing them upon himself. 
I'm actually very excited about that because I think the first time I will see 2020 in my whole life will be in the new heavens when I'm looking at the face of Jesus. And I'm looking forward to that day. But you know what, in the meantime, as we live in this world and as we do carry thorns and we do carry sufferings, I think God has a word of encouragement for us. Because as we await that day, when we will be free and when we will look face to face to our Creator, God says to us, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in your weakness. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you give us hope. I thank you that uh, there is a future where we will have no thorns. And I thank you that you made that possible by bearing them yourself. It was not a free future. It had a cost. Lord, I pray that we would, those of us with weaknesses, with thorns, I pray that we would allow your power to be made perfect in those weaknesses. I pray for those of us who are um, too much like our culture in that we value and are drawn to strength. I pray that you would help us to overcome those idols of strength and to, to walk the way of the cross, which is the way of weakness. I pray for those of us who don't feel your love because of the presence of the thorn. I ask again that your love would come in a tangible way. And I pray for us who are struggling to look to the future. I pray that you would, you would remind us of that future, free of the thorn. But more so than that, you would remind us of the man of sorrows who bought that future for us. We thank you, Jesus, and we love you. Okay, that's the same. Amen.